In this presentation, we explain the magic behind this collection of geometry nodes. Before we dive into it, let's see them in action. We set the first keyframe for the 10 Euler angles in 5 dimensions to be 0. Then we go to the last frame and enter magic values for the 10 rotations. Add keyframes and push the play button to see a plane rotating inside a 5 dimensional cubic lattice and eventually arrive at a slope where the projection of nearby faces turns into the famous Penrose tiling. There are three more parameters that can be adjusted inside these geometry nodes. We can increase the size of our five dimensional lattice. This leads to a larger patch of Penrose tiling. Additionally, we can shift the five dimensional coordinate system by a shift vector sigma. All five dimensional vectors are always implemented as two three dimensional vectors. You can keep this in mind for later. The second parameter shifts the unit cube that determines which parts of the 5-dimensional lattice are projected onto the 2-dimensional plane. In the most symmetric case, when this unit cube is centered around the origin and the shift of the lattice is zero, we obtain a projection that is not a Penrose tiling any longer. Since this flower-like arrangement of the 10 flat rhombs is forbidden in proper Penrose tilings. We want to shed some light on the subtle interplay between the various parts of these geometry nodes. They basically perform a heavy-duty computation. As it is shown here, more than 3000 vertices are computed. From these 3000 vertices, only a few hundred are kept when their projection is contained inside a convex hull, shown as the green polyhedron on the right. Then a few hundred faces for these selected points are computed and projected to give rise to this amazing tiling. Additionally, there are 50 5 by 5 rotation matrices that can rotate the bases of our 5 dimensional space with respect to 10 primitive rotations visualized by the 10 squares at the top of the screen. For a better understanding, we have prepared the same setup in three dimensions. Let us explore this toy version first. In the Blender files that we are going to analyze, generate the following animation. Different to the five-dimensional case, we can visualize the full three-dimensional geometry. This will not be possible for the five-dimensional version, but it hopefully makes things more exciting to watch as we explain the basics of the computation. In general, all the nodes colored in the raspberry red tone are input nodes. They can be used to customize the view. Let's turn on the grid. With the input node, you can control the radius of the displayed grid points. You can also increase the overall range for which the tiling is created. Next, we will scale up our projection plane. If you want to increase its thickness, you have to enter the node group and change the radius of the wireframe. Similarly, another input node grows the orthogonal line. We need the unit cube that the convex hull is constructed from. Let's zoom into a bit to have a closer look. The selected vertices can be scaled to arbitrary size. And last but not least, the selected faces are turned on. The entire view can be rotated independently. Let's investigate the role of the other input nodes. We can scale the tiles of the projection. We can shift the lattice and we can shift the unit cube and turn on the rotation markers. Every change will be adjusted in real time. This is really amazing, isn't it? What more or less looks like a children's game, adjusting wires between nodes and dials, actually injects a full-fledged computation of all parts of the projection directly into the heart of your GPU. Finally, let's turn to the Euler angles that rotate the plane of projection. As you can see, the three angles theta are collected into a vector, and this vector can be used to rotate the geometry of the plane with built-in rotation nodes. However, this will not work for our five-dimensional explorations. Blender cannot handle five-dimensional vectors and five-dimensional rotations. To perform rotations in arbitrary dimensions, we have to create our own rotation node. Rotations are most commonly performed with rotation matrices. A rotation that turns the xy-plane 
is represented by the following matrix R0, 1. Similarly, a rotation that turns the XZ plane is given by R0, 2. For simplicity, we keep the minus sign always like this, mixing clockwise and anti-clockwise rotations. Finally, it's no surprise that the rotation 1, 2 will turn the YZ plane. These matrices naturally generalize to five dimensions. There we will have to deal with 5 by 5 matrices, but the structure of two sine functions and two cosine functions rotating a coordinate plane stays the same. In the Blender file, we generated one universal rotation node. There will be three inputs, the angle of rotation and a pair of numbers that encodes the plane of rotation. You can see that the choice of the numbers determines which coordinate plane is affected by the rotation. For the indices 0 and 1, the rotation is performed around the z-axis. Similarly, the indices 0 and 2 turn the x-z plane around the y-axis and last but not least, the pair of indices 1 and 2 perform a rotation in the y-z plane around the x-axis. Of course, there is a price to pay for this universality. When you have a look inside this node group, you can see some nodes for computing the sine and cosine, but most of the nodes just take care that these sine and cosine values are transferred into the correct components of the three row vectors the matrix is made of. It would be quite a pain to create such a node group manually. Luckily, Blender is equipped with strong scripting capabilities that allows to create these nodes from scripts. In the next section, these rotation matrices have to be applied to our basis vectors. This is actually not a big deal. A look inside the relevant node shows three simple dot product operations that map the original basis vector into the new one. Alternatively, if we know a basis, we can enter this basis directly and the corresponding projection is returned within fractions of a second. For instance, the perfect diagonal cut-through of the cubic lattice is achieved by this basis. When all the Euler angles are set to zero and this rotated basis is entered explicitly, the geometry nodes automatically adjust the simulation and we obtain a nice symmetric tiling from our three-dimensional lattice. By now we have a solid understanding of the output opportunities that come along with this conspiracy of node groups and nodes. Let's now expand a few of these nodes groups and understand their internal structure and their computations. We start with the node group that is labeled with Z3 or Z5 in the 5-dimensional version. This node group generates the lattice. The overall extent of the lattice is controlled by the input value range. Let's turn this value down to 1. We expect the coordinates of the created lattice sites to vary between minus 1 and 1. In total there will be 3 cubed or 27 points. The data of these points is stored inside an attribute. It can be viewed inside the spreadsheet. Each point of the point cloud of our geometry now has an index and a tuple of Z3 coordinates. People that are familiar with representations of numbers in different bases can easily understand the way how the indices of the points are converted into Z3 coordinates. First, each number is converted into its ternary form. We show a few examples. Now each digit only needs to be shifted by negative 1 to get nice Z3 coordinates. The spreadsheet shows that now each point of the point cloud is attributed a position in the Z3 lattice. When the range is increased, the number of points is now the cubed power of another base number. For instance, if the range is 3, the base number is 7 and we get 343 points. Otherwise, the flow of computation doesn't change. For our two-dimensional flatlanders, the geometry is split into a two-dimensional projection plane that is defined by the basis vectors u and v and the orthogonal space spanned by the normal vector n. The projections are just the dot products with the basis vectors. The dot product with the normal vector returns a single number. This number decides whether the projection of the point lies inside the convex hull of the unit cube, which itself is just an interval. The dot product with u and v gives two numbers, which represent the coordinates on the plane of projection. 
the eight corners of the unit cube are generated almost like the z3 coordinates of the cubic grid. This time we only need zeros and ones as coordinates. Therefore, tuples are obtained from binary representations of the numbers ranging from 0 to 7. The projection of the cube into the orthogonal space is a one-dimensional interval bounded by a smallest and a largest value. We use the built-in convex hull node to construct this interval as convex hull from the projected points. It is easy to decide whether a projected point lies inside this convex hull. We only need to compare the number obtained from the projection with the smallest and the largest value. Once we find all selected points, we are ready for the last step. For each selected point, there are three possible options to construct a face. Consider the three unit vectors. Every pair of these three vectors can be used to create a face for a given point. The four points P, P plus E0, P plus E0 plus E1, and P plus E1 define the phase 0, 1. Similarly, the phases 0, 2 and 1, 2 are defined from the two other pairs E0, E2, and E1 and E2. When all four corners of a phase lie inside the zone of selection, the projection of this phase is shown on the plane. We realize this in Blender with the following computations. First, the projections of all corners are computed. The faces are very conveniently generated with the built-in extrude node. Starting from the first point of the face, this point is extruded into the direction of the second point. We obtain an edge connecting the two points, which is then extruded into the direction of the third point, sweeping out the romp. And this is all what we need to generate the tiling. In five dimensions, we lose the opportunity to visualize the full setup. Instead, our visual understanding is limited to the projection onto the two-dimensional plane and the projection into the three-dimensional orthogonal space. Since Blender can only handle vectors with three components, each five-dimensional vector has to be represented with the help of two vectors. The first vector stores the first three components and the second vector contains the last two components. Consequently, the rotation matrices consists of 10 input and output vectors. Each of the five five-dimensional rows are stored inside a pair of vectors. The generalization from Z3 to Z5 is straightforward. Instead of three-digit representations of ternary numbers, we now have five-digit representations. The projection and phase generation doesn't change in comparison to the three-dimensional toy model. The most interesting difference occurs with the convex hull. This time, the convex hull is a three-dimensional polyhedron. It is constructed with the built-in convex hull node. It is obviously more challenging now to find out whether a point lies inside this convex hull or outside. Luckily, geometry nodes provides a helpful tool to facilitate this decision. We start with two rays from the projected point into two different directions. When both rays eventually hit the convex hull, we can be sure that the point lies inside. Otherwise, the convex hull will be hit by just one or none of the rays. Unfortunately, the five-dimensional file is not running completely stable when the angles are varied. I don't know whether the node setup is buggy or the algorithm is too greedy, and exhausting the memory in an uncontrollable way. In general, animations run more stable with smaller lattice sizes. Let me know your experience with it in the comments and share improvements with me and the community. Both Blender files can be downloaded from the links in the video description. They are stored inside a GitHub repository where you can easily share your improvements by pull requests. That's all for today. Bye bye.